reintroduce uh, Mark Gilbert. Uh, Mark is with the U.S. Department of Energy. He's your Waste Energy Coordinator for Bioenergy Technologies Office. So, thank you, thank you very much, and we'll see who is more entertaining. I don't, I don't know that we need, need to have a vote or not. Uh, so, I would like to talk about some work that we have done, and in particular, it builds, it builds on a lot of effort from Pacific Northwest National Lab, PNNL, and the National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, and in fact, it's the same person who did the, uh, the gas availability study that Gus just cited. Her name is Anelia. So, we call it biofuels and bioproducts from wet and gaseous waste. We as bioenergy are interested in primarily in making liquid transportation fuel to replace petroleum. We also recognize that given the current state of oil and natural gas prices, that can be pretty challenging economically. So it's often necessary to make byproducts in order to make the whole thing work. So the, that's, and we acknowledge that. And in fact, there's, byproducts can still be replacing petroleum and can, in, in some cases, take advantage of the, of the difference, particularly the oxygenates in the fuel that comes from, from biomass uh, and make a different kind of product than you might make from petroleum. So where this comes from for us is that the General Accountability Office, which is kind of the, it's not right to say it, for the, they're the research arm of Congress. Uh, they issued a report in the fall of 2012, which is the fifth in a series that Congress had kind of been hammering on them to say, DOE, why are you not paying attention to the energy water nexus? Uh, and which is true that uh, the DOE had not been paying that much attention to it. And they said, in fact, that we're not uh, doing enough to meet our obligations that Congress had specifically directed us to do. Um, for this time, the first, this, at this time, the DOE actually agreed and said, yeah, you're right, we're not doing enough. And we launched what we call water energy tech team, or WET. Part of this was very much helped by former Secretary Menez, who has a long history of caring about these kind of issues. As a result, or as part of this, we produced this report, uh, which is 200 and something pages, in June of 2014. And we very much meant, meant that as a first step uh, and an invitation to a conversation, which has in fact sort of been occurring since then. And uh, one thing I'll highlight is that energy for and from water, I mean, specifically meaning wastewater, was a key area of focus in this document. So in bioenergy, we, we built on that. There's a, after that other report came out, there's a series of four workshops, and then there's also, and also something in collaboration with the EPA and the USDA about Biogas Opportunities Roadmap and its update. And then here you also see the logo for the Nutrient Recycling Challenge, which of course we had our session on yesterday because we're, we're involved in that along with the EPA. So just in January, we released our report. This one's only about half the size of the other one. Uh, so I don't know if that means it's half as good or not. So, but it, to, talking about, we wanted to do a pretty comprehensive resource assessment of focusing this time on wet and gaseous waste streams. Bioenergy has for a long time cared about things like corn stone, uh, which there's a lot, or you know, forest residues, all things that aren't necessarily the subject of this conference, but are certainly related. What, where we haven't paid attention to the, in the past is things like manure, and things like municipal solid waste, or even food waste, as well as gaseous streams, biogas, CO2 from all kinds of things. That, that, that's, especially biogenic CO2 is a potential feedstock. You can make stuff out of that. So these are, these are the kind of things that we were looking at. This is what we came up with. I'll note that everything, we do everything in dry tons so that we can compare it with uh, other kinds of feedstocks such as corn soap. Mm -hmm. So that's where, where you, you, you saw 100 million tons of dairy stuff. That's wet. I'm, I'm sure that was wet tons. And so that will explain the difference because as you know, it's pretty, uh, manure is pretty much water. So we came up with a total of all of these things and it can't, or at least of all the solid or wet things, of 77 million dry tons a year. Now this is in contrast when we also, the DOE puts out this report every five years or so called billion ton study. And that's the total amount of biomass that could potentially be available by 2040, I think it is. So 77 million is not a billion. But the key thing about these, these streams is that they are available now. You don't have to plant them. And in many cases, 
they are an existing disposal problem, just like the, the Gus was talking about. There are disposal costs, or <coughs> Smithfield can't get a permit to get to build any more lagoons in North, North Carolina. So that it's something that it, it's a, a pressing issue for many people. The biogas doesn't it doesn't really it doesn't make sense to really to weigh biogas. So that's not included in that number. But we did want to look at it, and we we did also we put up a no we, we put up DGS, DGS uh, distributed or dis distillers grains. We know that right now that's mostly going to cattle, but we just want it to be complete. We're, we're not saying that, you know, you should take it away from the cows and put it into biofuel. Okay, so this is moving away from the, the numbers. We want to, we have mapped, uh, this is done not just by county, but by the, where we could by location. This is um, based on USDA data, as well as a lot of interviews with state people. Um, to, to see where is this stuff, because ultimately you need some kind of concentration in order to make it an, an economical uh, conversion. And it's, it is kind of interesting to see where things tend to concentrate with, with dairy. You know, there's another, another one. This slide, that we, we've had these for a few months, has really made me think, I, I, I fly a lot, including to Denver and to the, the West Coast, you can really see this. As you, as you fly over it, 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 like Western Kansas, all of a sudden there start being capos and there start being center pivot irrigation. It's really kind of a clear demarcation, just as it shows up on that map, just because that's where the rainfall changes. But it, it was certainly of interest to me. And now, of course, here we are in North Carolina, so we have our lovely concentration of pigs, uh, as Gus, Gus was talking about. So there are clearly areas of distribution or and really areas, what we think of as areas of opportunity where we might be able to put some kind of a conversion facility and make biofuels and byproducts. So here's where this is, uh, go, this actually goes on from beyond what, what's in the report. We started to look at p and in particular is looking at what would it, you know, what if we actually got this stuff converted, not just using some kind of raw energy number, how much could we make? And they, they estimate 7 billion diesel gallons. Uh, now, that's a lot, but it is, and it's still it's substantial. It's 18% of the 2015 US diesel consumption. So it doesn't solve all our problems, but it definitely it, move, it moves the needle. And we also note that the, most of manure is by far the biggest, but food waste might be a nice blending source you know, to, to, get, to get you a richer, uh, a richer feedstock. We also know that these things are distributed. Uh, and as other people talk about, you just generally don't want to put manure in a trunk, uh, no, at least not very far. So what could be a solution is to produce a transportable inter intermediate, such as a bio group, uh, and put that in trucks. And then to integrate that with this whole notion of regional facilities. It's really, this is where we're, we're coming from, the world of petroleum refineries where it really doesn't make sense unless you're making at least 100,000 barrels a day. Uh, that is not viable for these kind of feedstocks. And the conversion technologies have to match the scale of the feedstock availability. So it really kind of turns that whole economies of scale thing on its head. Uh, what you have to go after is the economies of mass production instead of the economies of scale. So modular solutions that you can you know, kind of plug and play to, it's to the greatest degree possible. So it, again, that we, we know also with traditional, like silly lossing ethanol, needs dry feedstock. And it often drying is an early step. Well, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to dry manure down to 10% uh, moisture. So we need to use different kind of conversion technologies, things that can deal with wet feedstocks. And we have some of those on the table. Same thing with gas, it's just a completely different problem. So it's just, it's a different set of problems than what people have traditionally looked at, with, whether corn-based ethanol or cellulosic or, or biodiesel. So part of it, we, we did a resource assessment, but we also looked at the technology space for where there might be solutions to some of these problems. And again, we, we said wet, wet is different than gaseous, and then the whole notion of distributed kind of forces us into, into some different areas. So I'm not gonna read all this, but so I'm not sure if I got that slide or not, but we actually have between our labs and the Small Business Innovation Research Program, 
uh, and other activities. We've got projects in all of these areas at various stages of development. Okay, this is the um, hydrothermal liquefaction is one of these technologies that works on wet feedstocks. It's uh, wasn't necessarily invented by Pacific Northwest National Lab, but they've done a lot of work to develop it over the last 20 years. Um, so basically, you, you take sludge or algae to some degree of wood, but generally wet feedstocks work better, and put them at pretty high, it's just below the supercritical point of water. So it's very high pressure. Uh, 3,000 PSAG is roughly 200 atmospheres. Uh, so that means you need some pretty tough stainless steel. Uh, and you know, um, well above boiling, but it's still liquid at, at that pressure. But it's a pretty fast conversion, 10 to, 10 to 30 minutes. Then you get this bio crude, and you also get a, a watery product, which you need to do something with in order to make fat value out of the whole thing. Very little in, in terms of solids, like one, one and a half percent of inorganic, inorganic solids. So you greatly reduce your volume. Um, then you take the, the bio crude and what's called hydro treated, which is not that different than what you would do in a petroleum refinery. And then after that, you can make diesel and you can make jet. And uh, what's bottom is just generally heating oil. But diesel and jet is what we're really after. And so we've actually done this. Uh, p &L has done this. They, over the last year, they made, they took sludge from Vancouver and turned it into a really high-grade diesel feedstock. Uh, and so, and they're, now they're working with Detroit and doing, doing the same thing. So we, we've actually made stuff that you could put into a refinery. Not that much of it yet, but uh, we're working on it. So this is just some of the analysis that they're, that they're working on in terms of how much can, can, could somebody really make money doing this? And we, we like to use something called the uh, minimum fuel selling price. It's basically what would you have to sell it at in order to make money, including a reasonable rate of return. So right now with this feedstock, we're down to $3.6 a gallon. That's not good enough because uh, diesel is, I don't know, it's cheaper here than it is in DC, but up there it's, I don't know, 260 a gallon, so we've got a ways to go. But this is way better than a, a lot of other things. Uh, so it, it's, it's nicely along the way. And this is, full, this is fully upgraded, not just a raw cost. And, but again, the, the, the raw material is about 80% of the total cost. So if, that's, if we can get that down by improving the conversion, that would be a good thing. And here's, this is what we like to do, we call these uh, tornado charts, to, to sensitivity. So obviously you have to make assumptions when you do any kind of analysis like that. Um, so what, if your assumptions are off, where, what variables would really change things the most? The biggest is plant scale, uh, and which is back to this whole problem of economies of scale. It's a challenge because the bigger you make the plant, the cheaper you can make the fuel. So that's a trade off. And the other one is avoided disposal costs. We very conservatively assumed no cost. Uh, so we said we did not take any credit for <coughs> tipping fees or uh, avoiding you know, transportation or anything like that. But we did look at a sensitivity in case you are replacing tipping costs or tipping fees. That that does that's the, that's the second most significant thing that would help change change get the price down. Okay, so this is this is our, our summary, uh, and which is that these feedstocks are significant. They already exist. They're a problem that needs solution. And Congress actually cares about this. They're there. Pretty much every year they direct us in the appropriations language says, thou shalt pay attention to policy loans. Um, these streams are just gonna get larger, the landfill space is gonna be less and less available. In many cases, California, uh, among others, has passed restrictions on uh, diversion of organics from landfills that they're requiring up to 75% by 2020, it might be 2025. Um, these feedstocks require different conversion strategies, and they're also the economics are very different because you're solving a current problem and you're not planting crops. So it's just a, it's just a completely different way to come at this. Um, while there are challenges, these things could be, since they're out there now and they're, they're closer to being competitive than a lot of other things, they could be a leading edge opportunity to help move, get this whole notion of bioeconomy going. And there are just, p &L is not the only ones, and there are some actual solutions that are getting close to being ready to market. So that's why we continue to care. And I think that's it.
Is there questions? We've got some time here for questions. Are there any? Sure. So your your map of the uh, U.S. with the uh, where the different animal types were. I noticed that there were some big blank spots. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the data came from USDA. Um, why were the blank spots there? In some cases, there it's because there really aren't that many animals. Uh, in others, we, we it did come from the USDA as one source, but we also talked to at least. 25 states. We went for the ones that have the biggest production. So, in, in some cases, the blind spots are where we didn't go after. Yeah, USDA data, you could get down at the county level, you couldn't get any below that. You couldn't put dots on the map like you did. That's probably part of it. Absolutely. But the, the, the dots on the map do represent counties in this case. But we, in some cases, from some of these others, other sources, we were able to get like GPS coordinates. But yeah. Additional questions? Well, let's uh, 